Good morning. Good to see all of you here this morning with us, and good to have those of you joining with us online. Welcome to Victory Church Online from Chattanooga, Tennessee. We've got some things today that I want to share with you that I believe will be a blessing to you. So I would like uh, for you to turn with me to John's Gospel, chapter 14, and we'll get started today. Now, we are, uh, we've been talking for the last several weeks on uh, discord and, and uh, the importance of unity in the body of Christ, or the importance of unity anywhere. And I want to kind of continue a little bit with that, but, but we're kind of taking a, a turn or change of direction this morning. And I want you to look at John chapter 14, and uh, we'll begin reading in verse 25. John 14, 25. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things I said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let your heart, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now this is a, a chapter 14, chapter 15, and chapter 16, and chapter 17. As a matter of fact, turn with me to chapter 17, which is meant I'll show you this. Chapter 17 and verse 20. Jesus is praying a prayer uh, beginning in verse 6 here in chapter 17. And in verse 20, he says, I do not pray for these alone, meaning his disciples that are there with him, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Now, how many of you believe because you have read the word? So is this talking to you also? So Jesus actually prayed a prayer for you. This is applying to you. Now I want you to go back to chapter 14. All of this, all, chapters 14, 15, 16, and 17 are all tied together. Go back to chapter 14. And I want you to look at verse 12. Now, the disciples have asked him, Philip in particular has asked him a question. And he has said, Master, when will you show us the Father? And he said, Philip, 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 Philip. He probably said it just like that. He said, have you been with me this long and don't you know that if you have seen me, you've seen the Father? Now I want you to notice verse 12. Verse 12 is an awesome verse of Scripture in your Bible. And it starts off with most assuredly. Now in the King James Bible, this says verily, verily. Now, verily, verily is used 25 times in our Scripture. It's in the King James Bible, and all of them are found in the Gospel of John. Verily, verily is a very strong expression. It means of a truth, of a truth. It's repeating it. And the way that we would say it this way, if we were using the expression verily, verily, we would say, now pay very close attention to what I'm about to tell you. You're going to have a hard time believing this. So, the, and you'll notice that the 25 verily, verily scriptures in, J, in John's gospel bear this out. It's something that, that when you look at it, you go, well, yeah, I can see why he said that. This is one of those verses of scripture here in verse 12. He says, most assuredly, New King James, King James Bible says, verily, verily, I say unto you, he who believes in me. All right, we just, I just asked you a few moments ago. How many of you believe in Jesus because of the word that you've heard from them? So you all raised your hand. Um, so, verily, verily, I say unto you, he who believes in me. So who's he talking to or talking about? He's talking about us. He who believes. He's not talking about just the disciples. The works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. Now, I want you to notice here, he said, the works that I do, shall he do also. The disciples, well, not, not the disciples alone, but he's talking about he who believes. So is he talking to you? Is he talking to me? Yes. And greater works than these. And whatever you ask in my name, that will I do. Now then, you go on to chapter 15. 
in chapter 15 is the passage of Scripture where we find uh, verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. These particular verses or chapters here, chapter 14, 15, 16, and 17 in John's Gospel, these are eye-opening, enlightening scriptures for us as believers for God's plan for our lives. Now, back up with me to chapter 14 and verse 27, which is where we started this morning. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The reason that I bounced around to chapter 17 and chapter 14 and then came back to here is this. I want you to know, I want you to notice from what we've looked at in these different verses, verse 27 here about my peace I leave with you, he's talking to you. He's not just talking to the disciples. He's talking to you. Would you say right now, in this country, we are at a time to where peace <laughs> is not a common commodity among people right now. There, there's disease. Uh, there is a lack of peace right now in, in pretty much every segment of society. There's turmoil and confusion and uncertainty uh, just on, on a lot of different fronts right now facing us. And what I want to encourage you this morning is Jesus, in these powerful chapters in our Bible, one of the things that he emphasized was, my peace I'm giving to you. <laughs> I want you to know, verse 27, peace I, leave, uh, peace I leave with you. And then he says, what kind of peace? His peace. Now, we're not talking about you know, your best friend. We're not talking about your mother, although, you know, uh, your best friend and, and your mother can, can, you know, have a calming, peaceful effect on you. We're talking about actually something or someone who has even greater peace than that, and they have left their peace with us. Now, this word peace is a very interesting word. Uh, the word peace here, the, the Greek word, for peace here, literally means prosperity. Now, the way that it applies here is this. Where, when, it, when its root is prosperity, does this apply where just talking about prosperity is concerned? Yes, but it, but it goes far beyond that. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hands, and those of you at home don't have to raise your hands? How many of you have been through a time in your life when, let's say, your financial situation has been a little suspect? <laughs> it's been a little lean. Don't raise your hand. I would think that at some time in our life, each one of us have gone through that. How many of you in here would say that you have been through times in your life that your financial situation was bright, that it, it, things were going good. You were able to pay your bills and have extra money. Uh, you were able to, to, to put money into savings, into retirement, invest, go on vacations, buy things that you needed, uh, be able to help out others. Now I want to ask you this question. Looking at those two times in your life, those two situations, which situation provided for you the most peace? When you were broke or when you had abundance? When you had abundance. Prosperity is not the end all to everything, and we certainly don't emphasize that, but neither do we askew it either. Prosperity is part of our covenant. Prosperity does not just mean money. Okay, It's not just referring to money. Prosperity means to have more than enough. Prosperity means to have abundance. And one of the reasons that we are to have prosperity is to be able to be a blessing to other people, to those people that are less fortunate than we are. But when you have more than or, or when you don't have enough to pay your bills, it robs you of your peace, doesn't it? 
it puts pressure on you. It, it, it causes anxiety and stress. So that is how this word applies here in this context. It's the feeling or the uh, assuredness that you have when you don't have lack in your life. Now that lack can be in any area, right? You, you can have lack in your finances, which is where most people think of this. You can also have lack where your health is concerned, right? You can have lack where your emotional well-being is concerned, right? So you, you can have lack or you can have abundance in, in actually any arena of your life. So that's, what this, that's the reason that this root word prosperity, uh, or the, the root word here for peace, prosperity is used in this situation here, used in this particular context, in this setting. Peace or the, the feeling that you have, and it's actually more than a feeling, it's, it, it's, it's actually a spiritual force operating in your life. Uh, it, this, this also means to be at one. To be at one? Now we understand prosperity, but be at one. Be at one means to have something restored. You, you, you were on the outs with something, either finances or another person even. You could be on the outs with another person and, <clears throat> excuse me, you could be on the outs with another person and yet have that relationship restored, be at one again. So that's one of the meanings of this verse of Scripture. Now, as you know, the New Testament was written in Greek, translated in Greek here. <clears throat> so the Hebrew word for here, you're far more familiar with. The Hebrew word, in other words, you understand Jesus didn't go around speaking in, in Greek, okay? Jesus didn't use this Greek word when he spoke this. When this was translated into Greek, they used this Greek word to describe the word that Jesus used. And I bet if I were to give you a pop quiz right now, most of you would get this corrected. The word that Jesus used when he said, My peace I give to you, he used the word shalom. Now, do you remember a few weeks ago when we were studying the redemptive names of God? One of the seven redemptive names, one of the seven Jehovah names of God is Jehovah Shalom, the Lord, our peace. Now, the word peace, the, the word shalom doesn't mean warm and fuzzy. Oh, I'm just at peace. I don't have a care in the world. This word is far greater than that. The best definition for shalom, and this is the way that a... a, a, a uh, somebody describing Hebrew. This is the way that a Jew would describe this to you. The word shalom, the best way to describe the word shalom is nothing missing, nothing broken. So, nothing missing in your life. Alright, let's just look at some little bitty something here. How many of you have ever misplaced your car keys? You're about to leave and go somewhere and you misplaced your car keys. Your car keys are missing. Okay, now let me ask you this question. Does that produce joy and peace to you? No. No. As a matter of fact, when someone has misplaced their keys, that's not a good time to have a deep conversation with them about something, is it? Because they are focused on one thing, and what's that? Finding their car keys. Now, what I don't understand is, why don't you have a place that you put your car keys? When you come into the house, have a place that you put your car keys. And when you come into the house, put your car keys there. Do you know the only time I have ever misplaced my car keys? is when someone borrows my car keys. And they don't put it back in the spot that I have this de designated as car key spot. I always know where my car keys are. I always go to that spot, and you know what? There they are. But if, if and, and listen, usually what happens is people come in and they, ha and they have their arms full of stuff. 
either groceries or books or whatever, and, and they just kind of lay, they, they, they lay stuff down. And so they get placed at different places. Okay, my point being, when something is missing, it bothers you. When something is broken, it bothers you. The word shalom means nothing missing, nothing broke, and some insight we get into with, with the Greek word from this is when things are restored. So something has been taken from you and now has been restored back to you. Have y'all ever done that? You ever lost something? You ever lost a piece of jewelry? I remember one time uh, we were going on a dive trip. I think this is one of the ones we were going to Mexico. And Beth wanted to leave her rings somewhere. So uh, uh, she uh, l- took off her engagement ring. She took off another uh, precious ring that she had that she had gotten from her grandmother. And then she had another, uh, like a dinner ring, a diamond dinner ring that she had. And so she took those off and um, put them in a place, a safe place. So we went on vacation. This is one of our church vacations. This is one of our church dive vacations down in Cozumel. Man, it was a great time. We had a good time. Um, So we came back. She couldn't find her rings. And she couldn't find a ring. Now, this is her engagement ring. This is a ring that her grandmother gave to her. And this is a, in a, a very nice dinner ring. And she can't find them. These, each one of these rings means something to her. They are of great importance to her. They have sentimental value to her. And she cannot find them. And she looked everywhere. I mean, she everywhere. Couldn't find them. Couldn't find them, couldn't find them, couldn't find them, couldn't find them. Six months go by. By now, oh well. So I'm in my office. She was working at that time. She was working at the church full time. I'm in my office one day, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to have a nice new briefcase that I got about six months ago. And so I'm, you know, I'm using a briefcase. And so I, I didn't find something in my briefcase. And I thought, I wonder if that's in my old briefcase. So I go to my old briefcase in my office and I open up my old briefcase. And there is a brown envelope sitting down in my briefcase. Now, I don't recognize this envelope. I don't know what this envelope is doing here. I don't remember pudding. A brown envelope in my briefcase. Huh, that's odd. And I picked it up and it had something in it. And I opened it up and looked down in it. And guess what was in there? My little bitty wife's three rings. So I walked from my office down to her office. I said, sweetheart, I have something for you that is going to make your day. You're going to be so happy. What is it? She was in the middle of something. She was busy. He's always busy. And so I, I, I didn't get there. I just pulled the envelope out. Well, she recognized the envelope. Do you know why she recognized the envelope? Because she's the one that put the envelope in there. And, and she, she uh, actually children, those of you in children's church, she squealed really loud with excitement and glee. She was excited. I mean, she... she it made her day, made her week, made her month, made her year uh, getting those rings back. What were these doing in my briefcase? Well, I just thought that that was a really safe place because your briefcase locks, and uh, I just thought that would be a really safe place to put those. It was a place that they wouldn't get lost. <laughs> well, they didn't. They were right where she put them. It's just we couldn't remember where, where they were. So, so it, it causes, you're unsettled when you lose stuff. But buddy, when you get it back, that's great joy, rejoicing. That is shalom. Okay, that's what Jesus is talking about. Now then, one of the things that you have to understand is the enemy is trying to rob you of that. The enemy is trying to rob you of that peace. The enemy is bringing all kinds of stuff to come now, you know, we look in our Bible and we think, you know, 
Those people in the Bible had it made. They never had any trouble. They never had any problems. Well, I want to show you a story in your Bible that will give a good illustration as to how the peace of God can operate and work in your life. And so I would like for you to turn with me to Acts chapter 16. Now, what has happened? I'm going to catch you up here. Uh, we can go to Acts. Oh. Go to 16, 16. Now, what happened then is Paul and Barnabas are on what we refer to as their missionary journey. And they have been to Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. And these are all in the book of Acts. You can go back and look at this. And what has happened in, is in verse 19 of chapter 14, the Apostle Paul is stoned to death. Now, I believe, this is my personal opinion, uh, there in Acts uh, 14, 19, the Bible says he was stoned and was supposed to be dead, and they took him outside the gates of the city. Now, you have to understand, these people were experts at stoning people to death. This wasn't the first time they had done this. They knew how to check somebody to see if they were dead or not. And the Bible says, if, when you read in, in chapter 14, it says that the disciples gathered around him, and what do you think they were doing gathering around him? They were praying. And then the Bible says, and he rose up. Now, doesn't that sound like terminology for somebody that's, that's been brought back from the dead? The reason that I think he was killed is because of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 is typically, this is where you find the story of Paul's thorn in the flesh. I have a real good teaching on that, by the way, and I'm not going to get into that this morning, but it's really good. You'll like it. But in that, at the beginning of that chapter, he talks about how he knew a man uh, in Christ or out of Christ, in the body or out of the body, he doesn't know, but a man he saw in the third heaven. Now, the third heaven referred to in our Bible is referred to, the third heaven is where God lives. That's, that's, when you say you go to heaven, that's that heaven. Okay? So he's talking about somebody he met in heaven. Well, doesn't that imply to you that he died I mean, for you to get to the third heaven, you, you just don't show up like this. So, I believe that he died, went to heaven, and then came back. That's just my opinion, okay? So, anyway, he rose up, and uh, so great persecution is coming against Paul, right? So, we come on into Acts chapter 15. I mean, okay, they've stoned him. Chapter four. Now then in Acts chapter 15, there were some people that came up from Judea, Jerusalem, came up to where Paul had been preaching throughout Asia Minor, Turkey. He's in the area of Turkey. Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby are, are in Turkey, in Asia Minor. That's where he's been preaching. Well, people from Jerusalem come up, and they, the big deal that they are promoting is, and we find this in the book of uh, Galatians in our Bible, the thing that they're promoting is circumcision. They are coming in, and they're, they're, they're coming into Paul's churches, and they're telling the people in those churches, this is really good, we're glad that you guys have gotten saved, but you have to be circumcised. You're not a true believer unless you're circumcised. And the Apostle Paul and Barnabas, it tells us, you can read this in chapter 15 yourself, it says, Paul and Barnabas had no little contention against them. <laughs> That means there was quite an argument. You understand, these are representatives sent from the church at Jerusalem. Who is the pastor at the church at Jerusalem? James, the half-brother of Jesus, is the pastor. These are people representing that church that have come out and have gotten into an argument with the Apostle Paul and Barnabas. Apparently, it was rather heated. 
So they finally come to the agreement, you need to come back to Jerusalem with us. And so they come back to Jerusalem, and they appear there before the council. This is referred to as the Jerusalem Council. So Paul and Barnabas come back there before the Jerusalem Council. James, the brother of Jesus, is there. Peter, the Apostle Peter, is there. Now, you understand that Peter and Paul had great professional respect for one another, but personally, they didn't get along very well. Their personalities clashed. So here, Paul is, is, is presenting it. So they're going over uh, everything that the Apostle Paul has been preaching and how people need to be circumcised and, and how are we going to come together and what are we going to... How are we going to preach them? And we've, we've all got to be of one mind and one accord. So, verse 5 of chapter... You don't have to turn there, okay? But I, you're, if you're taking notes, in, in Acts 15, 5, it says, But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Off with their head. No, I, I added that. They didn't say that. They didn't. So, argument, going back and forth. Now then, verse 7 of chapter 15. When there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should believe the word of the gospel and believe. You remember that, don't you? That's five chapters ago in Acts chapter 10 when he goes to Cornelius', Cornelius house. That's been about 19 years since the day of Pentecost. So God, who knew the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as He did to us and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Actually, you do need to turn to Acts 15, 11. Now, uh, Peter's gotten to be a lot... Peter's become a lot better statesman than he used to be, and hasn't he? If you do not have verse 11 underlined in your Bible, you need to underline it, and you need to put a star by it. This is the foundational doctrine of Christianity. Is found in 1 Corinthians 15 11. Now it's found in other places in the Bible too. But at this council, during these meetings, this statement was at the whole heart, was at the core of what they determined. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. In other words, circumcision is not. The way to salvation, nor is it necessary for salvation. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul. So apparently Barnabas is, you know, he's chiming in too. Now then, also remember Barnabas, it is believed, I believe this also, it is believed that Barnabas is the person that we find in the gospel accounts that's the rich young ruler that went away sad because he had many possessions. It is believed that that was Barnabas. Well, as you can see here, apparently he got the revelation and is vital to the birth or the spreading of the gospel in the early church. Barnabas is playing a key role here. After they had become silent in verse 13, James answered saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. So he, he quotes prophets there. So they determine then that, okay, this is what we recommend that you do. Verse 20. Write to them that they abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. We just ask you, instead of putting all 613 things on you, we just ask that you stay away from these things. So, everybody leaves, everybody's friends, 
So they, they now have sent some people from Jerusalem to go with Paul, and they're gone, they've gone back out into the field. Now you have to be careful, because it says that they sent them out to Antioch in verse 22. There are two Antiochs in your Bible. The Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby are all in Turkey, in Asia Minor. This Antioch here in verse 22 is just north of Israel in Syria. So you can get confused. This is not the same Antioch where the Apostle Paul ministered for a year and they were called Christians here. This is not the same Antioch. This is the Syrian Antioch. And they were sent with them, Paul and Barnabas, Judas, and Silas were also went with them. So there's four of them that have gone out. And so they have a letter with them that the apostles have signed from Jerusalem and in that letter states what James had said earlier. So they go off to Antioch. They're ministering there. It seemed good for Silas to remain there with Paul and Barnabas. And so, they're, so Paul says, hey, Barnabas, why don't we go back to Asia Minor and let's go back and visit the churches that we, saw, that we ministered to earlier. And uh, Barnabas says, okay, let's go. But listen, I want John Mark to go with us. And the Apostle Paul says, I don't like him. He's lazy. He's a kid. I just don't like him. Barnabas says, I like him. I think he's got lots of potential. I think he ought to go with us. Paul says, well, I don't think he ought to go with us. And I'm the boss of this outfit. And Barnabas says, oh yeah? Who's the one sinking all their money into this? It's not you, yo tent maker, you. Besides that, you're short. Paul says, I don't need you or your stinking money. You, 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 you Barnabas, you just take that little kid and leave. I'll do this by myself. Now, you want to find that exact dialogue in your Bible? But what your Bible says is that uh, they had, um, in, in verse 38, but Paul insisted that they should not take uh, with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia. What had happened is John Mark had been with them earlier and he had left because it was too rough for him, too tough for him. Then the contention, verse 39, then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another, and so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. By the way, this is the same Mark that wrote the Gospel of Mark in your Bible. Alright, do you see the pattern that I'm setting out here? You go back to chapter 14, the, the Apostle Paul is having great success Division comes in because that's, those are the people that stoned him. By the way, that was the thorn, but that's another story for another day. So there's division that came. Division followed him at Antioch. Division followed him at uh, Iconium. Uh, people came in and stirred people up in Lystra, and that's where he was stoned to death. Then you find, so he gets out of that mess, raised from the dead. Now he starts back preaching, and now then the religious people come in and start messing up what he's doing. And so he goes down and gets that settled. And now everybody's happy and high-fiving each other, and we're all buddies now, and not only that, we've got some people here that want to go with you. So now then, everybody, they go off holding hands, singing Kumbaya to Syria. And then they start, and the devil comes in again and causes division again to where Paul and Barnabas separate. Silas decides to stay with Paul. Barnabas and Mark leave. So now they have, they're ministering. They are in Lystra. We're now to verse 16, which is where I ask you to turn to first of all. 
So there's a girl that's following them, crying out, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim salvation. She came out every hour, verse 19, But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace of the authorities. So what happened is, the apostle Paul cast the devil out of her. She was demon-possessed. There were men that were using her to make money. They didn't like the fact that their money had been taken away from them. So, they have them thrown in prison. This is in Philippi. Now, they're not thrown in prison that's a really nice prison. (laughs) They're thrown down into the dungeon of the prison. Do you know, it would have been a really good opportunity for Silas to have said, boy, did I pick the wrong one to go with. I should have gone with Barnabas. After the way that you acted, coming with you, you'd think coming with you, I'd see all kinds of miracles and stuff like that. And here, within a few days, we're thrown in jail. Not only that, we're down here in this stinking Dutch. God stinks down here. I cannot believe I was so stupid to come with you. Paul, I had just have to tell you. I mean, I've been following your lead on this, but it, 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 I blame you for us being in prison like this. Could have been home with my wife. But I thought I was doing stuff that was good for the gospel. And I was out here. And <laughs> I've never been in jail in my life. Couldn't he have said that? Don't most people that you know of, wouldn't they have said that? Because when people get in a jam, when calamity strikes, the first thing you want to do is blame someone else. Goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. It's not new. When things happen in your life, We want to blame somebody else and justify why we chose the way that we did. Because it's never our fault. But Silas didn't do that. Verse 24 tells us they put them into the inner prison and they fastened their feet in stock. So not only are they in the down in the basement of the prison, they're in stocks also down there, and there's been given a guard just to guard them. Here's one of those but scriptures coming up in verse 25. But, I love but scriptures. But means draw a line and let's look at what's on this side. So we know that on one side as they've been thrown in jail. Let's see what happens on the other side. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God And the prisoners were listening to them. So apparently, this problem that had occurred with them had not created division between Paul and Silas. They remained together in unity. They turned their attention towards God, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of their faith. They began to pray and to sing hymns out to God. And you know, come on, you know, Paul, they were singing at the top of their lungs. And all the prisoners in the place heard them. Let's see if anything happened. Oh, suddenly. Man, I love but scriptures, and I love suddenly scriptures. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone, not Paul and Silas, everyone's, including Paul and Silas, chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from a sleep, <laughs> so he was asleep, and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself because that would have been his punishment. The next day, when those prisoners had escaped, he would have been executed. 
So he was just going to do it to himself. But Paul called with a loud voice and said, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And he called for a light and ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Look at verse 33. And he took them, this is the guard, took them the same hour of the night, washed their stripes, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food. Apparently, he just walked off the job. I guess he figured, since all the prisoners were gone, there was no use in him hanging out at the prison. Either that, or his house was in the prison. Now, when he had brought them to his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. This is why the enemy tries to bring division in is to keep things like this from happening. He started back in chapter 14. Actually, it starts on way on back beyond that. We just picked it up in chapter 14. The enemy tried to thwart the preaching of the gospel time after time after time. And when you see the apostle Paul and Silas set aside those things and stay together, focused on the Lord, keeping their peace, Staying in unity. Not allowing discord, strife, dis- dissension, disunity to enter in division. God gloriously show- shows up. All of the chains were loosened. The prisoners were set free. And the, the, the person that was head of the jail was saved, he and his family. Don't be deceived. The reason this stuff goes on that you're having to deal with now is to stop the promotion of the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Don't lose that focus. Your enemy is not somebody of a different race. Your enemy is not someone of a different religion. Your enemy is not someone of a different political party. Your enemy is the devil. Your enemy is the tricks and the deceit that he uses to cause division that will cause you to lose your joy, to lose your peace, and then makes you react according to his ways instead of react according to the way that God says, and you will lose your benefit and reward if you act according to your emotion, if you react according to hatred, He's got you in His arena, and in His arena, He will defeat you. So don't settle. Don't step into that arena. Stay fighting Him according. Fight Him according to the weapons of your warfare, not His. Amen? Amen. So keep your peace. Nothing missing, nothing broken. I hope you got something out of today this time we'd like to receive our morning tithes and offerings. Those of you that are here, you have envelopes in front of you. Those of you at home, there will be a a slide a bit later on the presentation. Share how if you'd like to uh, give, we can do that. This time we'd like to do our morning confession. So if you'd stand up with me. We'll say our morning confession together. Everyone. Together, as I tithe and give offerings, I'm believing the Lord for vision and direction, jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, discounts and dividends, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, bills decreased, blessings and increase. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all my financial needs that I may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you agree with that, say amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for joining us at home today. My desire is that God's richest and best are yours. And remember, there is victory in Jesus.